Dankeschön. So, let me start with a little um, audience interaction. Um, who of you does not understand German? Okay, so I continue in bad English for you guys. Um, yeah, my name is Holger, and um, as Matthias said, I'm from um, Frankfurt Book Fair, and um, as you also said, Frankfurt Book Fair, that's not the correct name, um, because actually we are a fair where intellectual property is traded. And um, of course, intellectual property can be traded as books, but it can be also traded as rights, as licenses, as arts, as music, as whatever, films. And actually, the whole thing started just 500 years ago, I found out, when Agnes Dürer, the, the wife of um, Albrecht Dürer, sold some of the paintings um, of Albrecht in Frankfurt. So we followed that um, tradition, and um, three years ago, um, together with Christiane Zusalm, I started a festival for digital arts uh, during Frankfurt Book Fair. It's called The Arts Plus. And it was just the night before the first opening, when I stood in the hall, it looked like a mess. I couldn't imagine that this is going to be a proper fair the next day. There was noise everywhere, people building their stands, people bringing in stuff. And I was standing right in the center of this chaos when the doors of an elevator opened. And there was this guy, and he stepped out of the elevator, and he gave me a parcel. So the parcel was probably this size, and I took it, because I knew where it had to go. I took it and I placed it um, at its stand. And of course, I unwrapped it, because I wanted to know what's inside there. And what I found was this painting. Um, it looked like a real painting. It smelled like plastic. I touched it, I scratched it a bit, and it felt like a real painting. And I wondered, why is this guy painted like this? I mean, you could see the light and shadow um, sections in his face, which Rembrandt was um, famous for. You could see that his eyes are sort of watering. Was he just crying or is he happy? Why is he dressed like that? So I interacted with that painting. And I actually asked myself, why did the painter paint something like this or like that? And, like, and then I realized, I knew the whole time that not Rembrandt painted this, but it was a project um, that from, from um, uh, research um, uh, companies, from an advertising agency and a bank, and they wanted to produce a fake Rembrandt. They wanted to produce a K, an AI Rembrandt, and this is the, the, the AI Rembrandt. So I knew the whole time that this was not painted by a human being, but at the same time I acted, I interacted with it as if it was done by a human beings. So that was the starting point for me to think about, um, think about, can AI be creative? Can I be a creative power in our lives because we interact with it as we do with all the creations that are done by humans? So I did a lot of research. Um, in the meantime, we're going to to um, have the fourth version, um, so we are a tradition now, of the Arts Plus um, in Frankfurt this October. Um, I wrote the book and I talked with many people and I want to show you some of the projects and, and some of the, the, the findings that, that came across my way during that time. So let's start with an art form that seems to be pretty simple, text. And since the beginning of AI research in the 50s, scientists always ask the question, when will AI be able to produce a text like Shakespeare did? So there are many, uh, many versions of Shakespearean AI poems and poetry. And this is the latest one from July 2018, with joyous gambles, gay and still array, no longer when he twas while in his day, at first to pass in all delightful ways, around him, charming, and of all his days. So I'm not a Shakespeare specialist, but to me, this sounds pretty Shakespearean. Um, it's a good starting point, at least, right? But you could say, hey, poetry, that's so easy. What about pop culture? What about the things that Harry Potter says, for example? So there's another project from Botnix, which is like one year old now, or one and a half year old. It's called Harry Potter and the Portrait of What Looked Like a Large Pile of Ash. 
It's the eighth volume of the Harry Potter series, and it's not by J.K. Rowling, not done by J.K. Rowling, but by Botnik Studios. And unfortunately, the eighth volume so far only exists as chapter 13, and only three pages out of chapter 13. So I brought you one of these three pages, and again, if you look at it, the structure of the text is pretty J.K. Rowling-ish. Um, the words they choose, or the AI chose, is pretty J.K. Rowling-ish. Even the characters, of course, and what they say, sounds to me pretty convincing. The story in total is bullshit. It doesn't have any meaning, and that is because the AI that was trained on this didn't have an understanding of the context that this work is going to start. So you're laughing about the, 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 the bullshit story, right? Um, yeah, maybe this is um, an explanation why the AI I didn't know what it was um, uh, writing about. Um, because what we can, or what, what scientists do, you explained it in, in, in your first speech, is if you do pattern recognition, pattern recognition for texts, you can look for structure, for example. You can look for patterns in how sentences are built. And these two sentences, time flies like an arrow and fruit flies like a banana, the structure is the same, right? But the understanding of the words flies and like are completely different. The meanings um, are completely different. So we as humans, it takes a little time for us to recognize the differences, and it takes a lot of time um, for many AI engines to discover these differences, but we're getting better. Um, many of the news outlets, like The Guardian or The Washington Post, or agencies like Associated Press and Bloomberg, they already use robo-journalists to help them write stories, um, that each and every one of you can read every morning or can hear every morning in the radio. So there are good chances that the weather forecast, the sports news, the election news, whatever you came across this morning, were not written by human beings, but by machines. So these kind of texts are already among us, and um, they're already widespread. And I think um, it was the, the Washington Post that published like something like 750 stories written by AI, in, within the last 12 months in the paper. So these stories are already here. The, the technology is becoming pretty good, as I said. So far, it still had a lot of problems in understanding the context that these texts were done for, were created for. And then came the unicorns. They don't want to go away. So, OpenAI, the OpenAI initiative, just realized a few months ago this text. So the OpenAI initiative, the, the scientists working there, they invented a text. It's the yellow one. In a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountain. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. So this was the starting point for their machine. Now, their AI was trained on what they say, the internet. So all texts available to the AI as training materials were texts found on the web, news texts, and the task for the machine, the task for the AI was finish that text, finish that story. We give you the first two sentences and you finish it. Now, if you go through the text here, you find that the AI found a name, Ovid's unicorn, for the unicorns. The AI invented a scientist called Dr. Jorge Perez. He's an evolutionary biologist from the University of La Paz. So it recognized that the Ant Mountain, of course, um, are in Bolivia, uh, or are next to uh, Bolivia as well, and um, it invented even a quote by the team. By the time we reached the top of one peak, the water looked blue with some crystals on top, said Perez. So I think that's pretty creative, actually, that kind of story. And um, OpenAI also 
published another story that was a bit more uh, dangerous. And that story started with the sentence, um, it was something like, um, uh, the Russians reacted uh, brutally after um, uh, President Trump press accidentally pressed the button, and then the sentence uh, ended. So the machine came up with a story that uh, Trump hit a button, and then the rockets flew, and the Russians reacted, and World War was there. So again, the machine made up a text that was pretty convincing. For everybody reading it, it was a text that could be read in any newspaper, on the web, everywhere, and you would believe it because it is written so well. And this is where we come into a dangerous zone of how we as humans react to the creations. It's not that AI is bad, technology is never bad, but it's that we don't have any filters in our brains to distinguish between human-made creations and machine-made creations. And of course, also human-made creations can be bad, yeah, can have bad intents. We don't know that. So we have to learn to develop these filters in the next, within the next years because we will have a lot of these machine-made creations among us. So this was text. I already gave you one example of, of how images um, work. This is another um, image that was made up by AI um, within the last year. Um, the Edmond de Bellamy um, portrait here, uh, done by the Obvious Collective in, in Paris and sold by Chris, is sold by Christie's in an auction for 432,000. Um, this was the first time that an AI creation entered the real art market. Of course, that prize was not for the quality of the painting. That prize was made by Christie's for the first time an art, art piece was um, auctioned. Um, here. But it was the first time that it appeared in the real art scene here. So you might ask yourself, what is Google and Tencent doing here? Do they really want to take all the money away from poor artists? Do they want to become the better artists? Of course they don't. They engage in text understanding and text creation because we are going to use language and voice as the primary um, way to communicate with machines. They are introducing machines that can create images and also detect, of course, and analyze images because we live in a visual world. And it's important for machines and for technology companies to, yeah, to decipher that world, to um, decode our images. And we also learned this morning that when you're able to analyze an image, you are also able to create an image. And here I brought you two examples. One is made by a man, it's made by a photographer, the, the girl on the left and the girl on the right, is made up by an AI. Yeah. So if you look closely, you see some artifacts in the face, some, some water drops where they don't belong, or, um, but it's already pretty good. So let's do a little test with you guys which is done by a machine. So everybody who thinks that the girl on the left is done by a machine, please stand up. Okay. Everybody who thinks that the woman on the right is created by a machine, please stand up. So let's see if you're right. No, you're wrong. It's the girl done by a machine. Another one. Who thinks that the woman was created by a machine. Please stand up. Ah. So who thinks that the man was created by a machine? Please stand up. Again, you're wrong, I'm sorry. So as I said before, we haven't developed the filters yet to distinguish between man-made creations, human-made creations, and machine-made creations. And this might be a problem in the future. So we had text, we had images, let's look at moving image, yeah? Because we learned some several hundred years ago that um, photography can be falsified, yeah? But when I see a video, I believe that it's the truth, right? Can we start the video, please? I don't trust this thing. So this is the source object here, and this is the target subject. Both were filmed. 
And again, same technology we also saw this morning. Um, you take the source video, the system, the AI detects the poses of the source video and applies it to the second person. So what you see on the right-hand side was never filmed as a real person dancing. It's a made-up video of that person. She was pre-recorded, um, obviously, um, put into um, yeah, these poses um, by the dancers. Um, so I think this is um, pretty exciting um, because it also means that you can create videos where completely fake persona interact within the video with each other. Again, this technology is not new. Hollywood did something like this for many, many years, yeah, with CGI costing billions of money. What's new is that this technology is almost available for free. And um, it runs on small computer systems. So each and every one of you can download software to do things like that. Not exactly like this, but you can download software, for example, to do some deep fakes. Yeah? You could take your ex-girlfriend or boyfriend, put their face into a porn movie, yeah? and then upload it on the web. This is what many people do. Um, with their teachers' faces, for example. But of course, you can use it for more entertaining purposes as well. And could you please start the video? First I was afraid, I was petrified. Kept thinking I could never live without you by my side. But I spent oh so many nights just thinking how you did me wrong. But I grew strong, and I learned how to get along. And now you're back from outer space. So again here, you obviously, this is the fa face of Nicolas Cage on my face. put on I the body that of Amy Adams. I should have made you leave your key. And if I'd have known for just one second, you'd be back to bother me. Really you oh, wanna now go. This is really cheaply done, yeah? So you can see it in the face when, when she moves or he moves, um, um, that it's not perfectly done well. But I just wanted to show you what possibilities you have with software that doesn't cost a thing. And the only thing you need is one source video of Amy Adams and probably 50 pictures, not videos, pictures of uh, Nicolas Cage. And then you can train the system and um, you can recreate that video. So, of course, there are problems and there are flaws at the moment. One problem is that when a machine analyzes an image, the machine has a different understanding of what is in that image and why that image, for example, stands for a pick. If you just add some random noise, and not that much of it, then the machine ends up thinking, oh, this is an airliner. Um, for us humans, there's no difference in the two images. For a machine, it is a difference. This is used by artists like Tom White, for example, to create images that cannot be decoded by humans, but only by machines. So let's do a little test. What do you think is, do we see here? Sorry? Two channels. Two cha wow, you're good, you know that. Oh, couldn't you have said something like kidneys? Yeah? <laughs> or, or, or goulash or something? I see kidneys and goulash, yeah? <laughs> Oh, this is a music conference, that's why. Um, so, hey, congratulations, you're as good as the machine. Um, and the machine, in this case, detects it as, oh, this is 98% um, probability of a cello image. Yeah? And Tom White does a lot of these. Um, it has like, he has like fans and, and windows and whatever, so it's, it's really entertaining to have a look at it and see how different um, we humans and them machines um, decode or code um, images. So, to sum up, I think the, 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 the question in the beginning was, can, I, can AI be creative? I don't think so at the moment. That AI can be really creative in the sense that it can come up with new solutions for problems. And that is one um, uh, definition of creativity. But AI can produce a lot of creative output that we can mistreat as creative output. So we use the AI creations exactly in the same way as we would use human creations, and that is what makes it probably difficult. There are some issues we have to solve at the moment. Um, I could write Facebook up here, but I uh, wrote abuse and trust problems that we have at the moment, um, because there are so many of these creations seen and used in media, especially uh, in social media, Facebook and, and Instagram as well, 
um, that definitely have, an, have abusive power. So we have to learn to build trust, and technology companies have to learn to build that trust. Um, uh, among us. We have copyright and we have intellectual property issues. You already talked about that um, today. So if you train a machine on images of Rembrandt, I mean, good, yeah, Rembrandt is dead for more than 70 years, but who owns that intellectual property in the end? Does Rembrandt earn any money with that because you used only his works? Probably not. Is the intellectual property the code, the machine code that was written by, by programmers, or is the intellectual property the outcome of it? Hi, Seda. Um, the outcome of it, um, which is usually the intellectual property of creatives. We have system vulnerabilities, as we saw with the pig airliner image. It's easy um, to lure machines into wrong directions. We have bias, we have dirty data at the moment. I don't have to elaborate that. And we have, we are, after all, at the university here, the tech humanities divide, which means that there's tech at universities and there's humanities at universities. But you can't develop new technologies without thinking what it means for society. So we need to bring these different parts of universities, but also of our society together. So, thank you very much for that very, very brief thing. Usually, I take an hour, Matthias. So. <laughs> Holger, of course, I don't let you go without one question, ah, at okay. least. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, so, when you look at the uh, traditional part of your business, at the Frankfurt Book Fair, um, what are some of the, can you mention one or two examples of publishers uh, that you work with that are actually navigating this new world in an exemplary way or, you know, where you say this is a really very good example of how you think, you know, to bring it forward? Yeah. So one example is um, publishers using machine-created images, um, for example, um, in publications that are one-off publications, like news publications or um, advertising. Yeah? It's easier to use for personalized advertising, personalized images, mm -hmm. for example. There's one example, and the other one uh, comes from scientific um, publishing. And uh, scientific, scientific publishers um, are using AI to um, build keyword structures mm -hmm. um, that link different um, parts of their, um, uh, their archive mm -hmm. together and um, make older articles, older books, older journals, older images, whatever, detectable. Mm -hmm. So um, it would take centuries um, if humans um, did that work, but now that machines <laughs> can be created that have a, an understanding of the context and uh, of the content, of um, these books and articles, um, you can use that understanding to link them together. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you very much, Holger Folland. So now is the time that we uh, convene our panel. Um, the panel um, consists of, and I'm calling up on, on the panelists to come on stage now, Patrick van der Smarkt, please, from Volkswagen. We heard his presentation earlier. Joey, Joey Liskey from uh, MXX Music. <laughs> Shudan, as we've seen before. And then Steffen Holly from the Fraunhofer Institute. Where are you, Steffen? There. I have also the, yes. <laughs> I have the great privilege of introducing Seda Röder. She's the founder of Sonophilia, and she's going to moderate the panel. Welcome, Seda. Seda will also be the uh, MC uh, for the rest uh, of the day on this stage. Um, I, think, I think we can leave it over there. No, I think that's fine. Okay. Perfect. We have four microphones for four people, and I have my headset. Welcome, everyone. How are you doing? <laughs> Thus far, mind blown already? Yes? No? Tired. Tired. <laughs> lots of, lots of, uh, lots of food for thought. Um, and um, I would like to start with a 
short introduction. I mean, we have, we have already heard a lot of things about artificial intelligence, about the different uses of artificial intelligence. Um, so we now know, actually, the AI um, is an integral part of our lives already. Whenever we use our uh, smartphones, sometimes they seem to be even smarter than us. Um, Whenever we use our smartphones, whenever we use our computers, in one way or the other, we are encountering an application, a sort of application um, of AI. In certain industries, such as manufacturing industry or health industry, um, artificial intelligent uses seem to be common practice already, so um, that's a no-brainer. However, when we start talking about creativity, in conjunction with artificial intelligence, then suddenly the discussion gets really heated. But as we have already heard from Holger's talk and from the talks before, that the artificial intelligence already is technically capable of some sort of um, creative outcome um, that stands out of discussion. So technologically, we're already very much capable and sometimes even excel human performance in uh, doing certain things. But whether that's real creativity or not, that discussion kind of brings us into a philosophical black hole, and we don't want to go there, <laughs> because that's not a further uh, good discussion. It's an endless discussion. Uh, in my panel, I'm really lucky to have discussion partners, um, who, um, some of whom you have heard already, um, who are experts in different uses of AI, who are encountering artificial intelligence in all sorts of different forms um, every day in their work. And we are going to be deep diving into the question of how humans and artificial intelligence and computers in general will be um, working together in the future to enhance human performance, to bring us to the um, next level, as Stefan uh, Scherzer put it already beautifully. Um, given the time constraints, I would like to jump um, in and ask all of you uh, one or two sentences about who you are again, once again, for the um, audience and what you do. Um, two or three sentences. Let's start with you, Patrick. <laughs> I'm Patrick and it's this thing didn't work, do I need to switch it on? Don't, don't worry, just start talking, right. it's going it's gonna oh. to switch on. I, it's not my day with technology. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Patrick, I'm, uh, I've been working with machine learning uh, for, for many, many, many years uh, since Maybe my master's. Maybe a little master's. closer to me. And uh, I'm doing the, exactly the same now for Volkswagen since two and a half years. And um, if, if that was the first sentence, because of the first sentence, now the second one is that um, I get very uncomfortable with the word AI because I don't know what it means, and that's why I prefer to talk about machine learning because I know what that means. Okay. It looks like a good hook, so we'll, we'll come back to that. How about you, Joe? Hello, I'm Joe Lisk. Um, I have a PhD in artificial intelligence and composition, um, but I'm actually a practitioner, so I did my master's at the Royal College of Music with Joe Horowitz, which is why it's an honor to be here, and thank you very much for allowing me to speak in English today. <laughs> um, so I am the CEO of a company which is creating artificially intelligent uh, tools for musicians and for the music industry. Yes, it's very exciting. We're going to be coming back to that. Um, Shu. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, my name is Shu Dan, and um, as um, Matthias already introduced me, I'm an art historian and an expert on contemporary art, especially Chinese contemporary art. And I work as a curator and exhibition manager. So I'm working with different partners, institutions uh, worldwide on, on different uh, art projects, exhibitions. And with my company, we're also uh, developing right now with different partners from China on um, models, uh, new models on, of um, exhibitions involving digital art on digital, uh, digital transformations. Technology. Yeah, excellent. And Stefan? Yes, um, I'm, I'm Stefan. And the mic is also not working that well, so I hope to speak a little louder. Um, my first life was also being a musician. Can, maybe, music, maybe we can pass the other and, uh, yeah, 
I take the other mic, that's okay. Um, put it aside. So, repeat that. Um, I, my first life was being a musician, studied music, and then I became uh, a product developer in uh, music technology for a long time. Then I founded a startup based on music rec rec recommendation, mm -hmm. and that's also, I would call it machine learning, not AI. And since uh, some years I'm working for Fraunhofer, they are wild well known for signal analysis and uh, also machine learning on audio, but also in, on, on text and uh, audiovisual uh, media, and I'm developing research further on. And um, I myself, maybe I should introduce myself as well. Um, the last name says it too, so I'm a roder. <laughs> and uh, I am the co-founder of the creative leadership network Sonophilia, as well as a strategic innovation company called the Mindshift.Global. And I am a graduate of this house, actually, uh, Mozart Theum graduate in uh, piano performance. So, um, so that we all know each other now a little bit better. I would like to jump um, to the discussion immediately. Patrick, um, I was, when I was researching about uh, what you guys do at Volkswagen, um, I realized um, a sentence you said, and I'm going to quote it, you say, we concentrate on the research of fundamentals for AI because we believe that AI in its 21st century interpretation is only just beginning. Um, what do you mean by that? Can you open it up a little bit? I mean, we, um, we keep hearing AI, AI everywhere, um, and we also keep hearing that it's been around for a long time, but you think it's actually just the beginning. I, I, I hope I didn't say AI, but ML. Well, anyway, um, <laughs> you, I think be that as it may, um, the, the, the thing is that if you look at what those methodologies can do nowadays, is that they are basically able to replicate uh, human performance. And by that I mean is that, that they are very well in, in learning um, from human examples, from human annotated data, in a way that's even better than humans can do it. Um, and then I'll perform them in, in some, some very li limited tasks. That's not enough. That's not enough to create a system that can, uh, can autonomously um, uh, make decisions based on past experiences. So what you really have to do is to look at the system that can, can uh, explore their world, whatever that means, right? It can be in a machine, it can be in, in a camera, it can be in a factory, it can be, it can be anything. Um, but explore their world and make optimal decisions based on what they have ex explored before that. Um, uh, and, and, and we're playing with that idea um, mm -hmm. very much. So. And we can do that in, in, in these kind of systems, right? And, and I, I, know, I know it's an important part, and I know that if, if anything, um, you're talking about intelligence, then maybe that's it. It's making optimized decisions based on your previous experience and based on your expectation in the future. So, so we, we are very far from being able to do that with machines. Um, that's true, but on the other hand, I mean, when we look at the human decision-making processes, as Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner, put in his book called Thinking Fast and Slow, he says, we humans actually never make decisions based on data. We make decisions based on emotions. And then we try to justify whatever we have decided for with this so-called system too, in order to make a logical explanation. Well, that's, that, that's true, but the, <laughs> but the decisions you make are based on your previous experience. Yes. And your, your expectations. And that's based on the data that you've, you've processed before. Yes. Right? And, and you see that on a daily basis. When, when I'm cycling somewhere, I make my decisions on, on my expectations, what will happen if I turn my steering wheel to the right or to the left, and what the others are doing, how other cyclists are, 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 are performing there. And that's, that's why we can do that. Uh, same thing. If I'm cycling and I see a, a dog crossing the road, I know it's going to be a disaster because a dog cannot predict my movement. And I think that's because a dog has never cycled and is not, not aware of this kind of speed and being, being aware of that. I think we should put dogs in cycles, or not bikes, and whatever, <laughs> make cycling safer. But that's a different story. Um, uh, but, but all of that is based on, on learning and, and learning and interacting with your environment. And so I think decisions are based on that. And when you, when you talk about um, fundamentals research in the realm of machine learning, artificial intelligence, predict predictions, etc. Uh, how is that different than um, a 
Or why is a company like Volkswagen interested in this kind of uh, research rather than you know, computer vision, the, the typical stuff we um, kind of expect uh, for driverless cars, etc.? Um, how is this furthering um, their vision of, of going you know, more advanced? So, so in, in indeed, we do not look at problems. We look at solutions, and then sometimes find a problem for the solutions we find. <laughs> and 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 the reason for that is that um, in machine learning, uh, the research you do is a bit different from very many from many other fields. Um, namely, that once you build an algorithm, you do the mathematics and you do the the, the software, you implementation, you make it efficient, and so on and so forth. And then in the end, you have something that does something, and then you have to test it. So you get some data set, you, you download a trivial data set from the internet or you have it already on your computer and then you test it and then you say, okay, works, maybe not, I improve it. And that's an incremental process. Get it the next data set, the more complex data set, until at a certain moment you say, well, I can do something, I can do X with my methodology, I can make a decision faster or, or, or in, a, in, a, in a different, different uh, environment and so on. Um, once you've done that, you're actually pretty close to deploying a methodology, mm -hmm. to applying it to something real. And, and indeed, in a few cases, we have been able to do that. A method that has been developed in our lab, we give it to another department and give them, give them two or three weeks, and they can actually use it in some production process, in quotes, because it's not production in the way you understand it, but in, in some, some, some applied uh, setting. Mm -hmm. So in that way, um, yes, we're doing fundamental research, but deployment is very near. And as mentioned, uh, uh, machine learning is very, very far from being as efficient as it could be, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. We're going to come back to um, that discussion, but I think this is a good point to turn um, back to you, Stefan. Um, at the Fraunhofer Institute, you're responsible um, for research to business aspects, right? And um, a lot of your research um, is in the media realm, including you know, um, um, moving picture, uh, including music. But how does all of that fit into this landscape? Um, what is the inherent interest um, you guys have um, with the AI and with the um, different uses? So first, there was a pattern recognition to um, find a way to introduce media more better to, to human beings, just a recommendation based on millions of tracks we have available. This is pattern recognition, just like we all know from uh, today's uh, media outlets, just uh, we know Spotify and Netflix. They have a recommendation algorithm, of course, and this is pattern recognition, which I was listening before. And we did automatic annotation, and this was the beginning in, at, from machine learning in our institute. And of course, we are trying to sell this uh, approach to the industry, uh, but it's uh, it's, it's very hard to sell something to the media industry uh, uh, because uh, there, there is not that much money. And uh, of course, you, you get a lot of people who are interested in music. So we take music as the entry point to engage people to solve problems and then we convert things we have discovered into the industrial world as well. So based on music recommendation, you can also do recommendation and classification of sounds and things you hear in the industrial environment. And um, yeah, but also from time to time we have uh, very, very strange things uh, running uh, in the free research as well. So for instance, our I won a PhD for some years ago, found out that he has compared the uh, works of Bach and he found out there are a lot of signs that Bach maybe not have written that uh, based on the uh, machine learning algorithm he put into the MIDI data and he found out that uh, there were a lot of signs that his son Philip Emanuel and his wife were writing some stuff. And that was the outcry in the scientific, and also uh, the, the, the bigger outcry was in the, in the classical world, of course, because this is touching Bach's repertoire. That was uh, thank something thank unthinkable, you. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, so, of course, we, we have a mix of freedom, doing basic research, but also trying to find out. And very, very important for us is to build a kind of a explainable, explainable um, uh, machine learning because we found out that it's that a lot of people don't think about that. A lot of, uh, first of all, a lot of algorithms are not really AI. A lot of people painting AI in their slides and their pitch decks, but it's simply automatic decision make, making. This is a quite, quite simple process. And uh, but uh, if you can make your 
uh, artificial intelligence or your machine learning explainable. That's something really important because uh, preventing these, uh, Mr. Folland said, uh, these, these fakes and, and all these things, that is um, very, very important for our future. And that's why we are doing also plagiarism detection, we are doing audio forensics, we're doing video forensics so that we can detect deep fakes and all that kind of stuff. And coming back to the artificial world, of course, we can detect plagiates. And that's uh, then used and uh, reused and also in, in trials in, on the court. And there was a famous example where we found out that's really reused content, copyright, and then you can really uh, mm. get the money for the artists as well. I think that's a very important point. But before going into that, I would like to hook a little bit more um, into this idea of recommendation. Um, so right now, my feeling, um, I can't really um, scientifically prove it, but um, how lots of, for instance, social media works is um, you click on certain things and then they kind of get, your, get an idea about your preferences, um, like also in Spotify, and then you start being fed the same thing, more or less. Um, and then you create these, um, or you're suddenly you find yourself in these filter bubbles. And um, how about once an artificially intelligent system starts, you know, composing music and uh, doing more and more recommendations, how are we going to free ourselves from um, being fed the same thing over and over again? Yeah, that's, uh, you have to combine several techniques, of course, and uh, the, the first thing we found out uh, some years ago uh, when I was working also in the startup for music recommendation, um, we brought together several recommendation techniques and uh, found out that it's more practical to use it. So you have collaborative filtering, which is based on your actions. You have signal-based, only signal-based uh, recommendation, which is based on really the signal and the noise is coming from the music. And then you have, of course, uh, the, the Amazon kind of thing, this is collaborative. And then you have the social thing from, from, from uh, how your people, how your crowd is interacting. And if you mix this all together, you get maybe better recommendations, but music is emotional. And of course, I'm, I feel lost a lot of times when I'm pressing the My Playlist button on Spotify every week because they recommend stuff which I really don't like that much. I'm, I'm feeling lost in the filter bubble as well. And um, that's, uh, of course, an unsolved problem. But uh, for most of the people, that's at, at, it, it's quite enough to, to get this recommendation just like it is, and uh, yeah, we, we were trying to make it better, but it's not solved, and uh, yeah, that's uh, still a challenge. Mm. Then again, if, if you listen to radio, it's a rare thing that you're being surprised by the next piece of music that's being played, is it? Well, I think, um, you know, when you look into these songs created by AI, um, faking, um, um, what's the British band, oh my god, um, Beatles, um, yeah, I know. So, I, I'm just, I'm just too young for that, you know. <laughs> um, um, faking, faking Beatles, etc. Then you get um, really overwhelmed about how similar those things can be. But also, when you look into the music being broadcast on radio, it's the same thing over and over again. Because Shakira did a song that that worked well, that sold millions of copies, every other song is in the, in the... So I think two things, just from talking to you both, emerged in my mind and also from uh, Holgar's talk before. So we will obviously need some sort of organic, non-organic stamp of approval type of thing for whatever website uh, we're, we're uh, watching. And we will have some sort of, we will have to have some sort of um, Break the filter bubble algorithm. I don't know what that means, but... <laughs> yeah, the, the interesting thing also is that uh, a lot of uh, thing, music you are hearing in radio is already designed with uh, so-called writers' committees. Oh. So it's the lowest common denominator, so people coming together. And uh, we were talking on, uh, I'm doing guest lectures in Pop Academy, and we were talking also with the guys uh, teaching artificial uh, um, courses, and they said, these guys uh, will be replaced by uh, artificial intelligence or machine learning very soon. Because if you always reproduce the stuff and you're trying to figure out what's the next hit and you're putting together a lot of people 
and then you're producing 250 songs and then choose, uh, Rihanna is choosing from the 2,000 writers uh, 10 songs, then that's the lowest common denominator and this could be replaced for sure in the near future because this is, this, this is something the automatic decision making can, better, can be better, hmm. of course. I think this is a great point to get back to get to you, Joel, um, because your software, it, it is a software, right? Okay. Um, is an absolutely, um, it, it's, a, it's an efficiency booster um, for the music industry. Um, it's called MMX, MXX, um, and you call it an adaptive music encoding software. Can you tell us a little bit, explain it, um, what it does and how it does it and how, um, how you're going to be changing the landscape of production music soon? Uh, yes, in fact, we've had an interesting narrative through previous conversations, which hopefully this can uh, help uh, tie together. I also empathize with uh, Patrick's disdain for the words AI, okay. um, <laughs> because artificial intelligence itself tends to be a byproduct of a breakthrough in cognitive psychology or cognitive science somewhere else. It'll be a philosophical breakthrough or a, um, a sociological breakthrough or a breakthrough in the studying of humans or the way that our mind works or natural language processing. This will give us a core that we can then use in an artificial intelligence sense. And we have this thing called the AI effect, which is essentially the very second we work something like this out, and we say, oh, we, we know this component of AI, everyone says, well, that's not AI, that's just figuring out what the shapes are of a glass. Mm -hmm. So um, this is a common, common component, but the breakthrough that we've had through the decades of study in, uh, from myself, my research and the research of people uh, in the company is we've realized a philosophical uh, breakthrough, which really, this really comes from a gentleman called Garrett Wiggins, who was my primary supervisor, but is also a leading mind in the AI music space. And it's a philosophical uh, breakthrough, really, which states that from everything that we can see and everything we can observe in uh, the scientific world, music in itself does not have a quasi-platonic form. None of us can agree on what it is. And therefore, scientifically, what we're asserting is that music doesn't exist. It's actually a byproduct of the way that we process. And that's the reason why one of the only constants that you really get through music in all cultures is this principle of tension and release. This idea of trying to predict the future and being rewarded if you do so. So this starts you off as taking it away from a kind of sophistic argument to say, what does this mean philosophically? It starts you off in a very interesting place. It means that um, although, as, as um, Patrick said earlier, there are great influences from stuff like mathematics where we use them as inspiration to create music, there is no mathematical basis to music. It is 100% learnt codes and conventions. Now they're taught to us depending on the culture from which we're from. Which means if you try to then search for the answers within a music signal alone without taking into, a, into account the mind which could be appreciating that signal, then your theory is suspect. Consequently, you really want to be studying the way the mind appreciates the music signal. And that's where our software starts off. So we have used this technique. And what it's done is it's given us the ability to categorize and break down different elements of music from different cultures and allow us to repurpose it for editing purposes. Mm -hmm. So this has allowed us to create an artificially intelligent music editor that can reshape the narrative of piece. But it's also helped us very recently uh, make a breakthrough in the search space, uh, which seems pertinent considering the conversations we're having. And we have now a technology, now a, a principle, which will allow the machine to perceive human emotion and to understand human emotion. Not empathize with it, but nevertheless, it can understand and perceive human emotion. And that means, whereas we have traditionally looked for, for uh, search the music space to, to talk about your bubble in two ways. First of all, 
we throw out the music because as we said it doesn't exist so the best thing is let's look at the metadata of of people using within an ecosystem if you're spotify you have 100 million people and you'll say well you've listened to 20 things i've listened to the same 20 things so if you listen to one other thing i probably am from the same subculture i have the same cultural codes of conventions which i'm used to i'll probably like that thing and we've never listened to the music and that works really really well the, the problem comes when we try yet again trying to find the answer within the music without taking into account a model of the mind. So there's another technique we have, which is feature extraction, where we say, take a space, no matter how many dimensions it is, and say, well, let's start looking at the features in a piece of music, we'll put them into this space, and if any of them are close together, we'll say, well, they must be the same. Problem is, humans do, do not think that way. And when we try this with training sets, we get very mixed results. We, we hit this typical thing called the glass ceiling in music information retrieval. So just to finish off, what our technique does is it takes account of a map of the way that the mind sees this space, and it puts the emotions into this space as well, and measures the distance of tracks from that emotion. So rather than you actually saying, these tracks are close to each other, however, this track over here seems to be much more similar to this than these two, it says, well, what's the distance of these from specific emotional concepts? And that gives a much better result. Um, I think this was a great introduction. However, I would like to uh, wrap up by saying one thing I found really fascinating about um, your software, which um, was featured in one of the videos you have put on your website. It's a very, it has a very practical use. Um, for production music. Let's think about the scenery. Um, you have film music uh, that goes for almost, I don't know, one and a half, two hour feature film. What you want to do is you want to create a trailer, which is going to be only 90 seconds to 120 seconds. So you can just push a button and his software goes through the entire thing matches certain scenes and emotions, and it distills this two-hour music automatically to your two-minute video without you realizing that it hadn't been done by a composer. Meaning, it finds the perfect places, people who are familiar with the editing process, you always have to find the perfect place to cut in and cut out from the music so that you don't get this feeling of being chopped. So his software does this automatically. It's revolutionary. Really, it's an absolutely freaking efficiency booster. <laughs> but, but, how are we going to be doing with all those jobless production people? Well, actually, they're the ones most excited by it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So we, we as, I, as I come from a practitioner background, this is something which is at the core of the company because my PhD was actually in artificial intelligent composition. Mm -hmm. But I think the last thing the world wants is machines writing or creating their art for them. What we, you know, AI is here to do one of two things. It's here to replace you, it's here to empower you. Mm -hmm. And we very much like to go for the empowerment of creatives, the empowerment of rights holders. And that's what all of our tools do. That's what they're designed to do. And there are certain things in the world now which require technologies like this because no matter how good you are as an artist, you simply do not have the abilities to be able to cope with the way that there are demands on music now. A prime example is, as you just say, the repurposing of a piece of music for a different narrative of length. Like, mm -hmm. It's only recently that music has become a static artifact, but with a recording. Mm -hmm. Before that, we had pianists performing to cinema, and we had, you know, List would, would go and he would improvise a storm at a party. This is all a very fluid thing, depending on audience participation and, and narrative. But now we have this fixed asset, and suddenly everybody looks at it as if, well, that's the perfect recording. Or <laughs> um, So what we're trying to do is bring the fluidity back to music to say, well, this is now dynamic again, which means that you can blur the line between the artist and the creator. Mm -hmm. And to give an example where that's essential is in something like aug augmented reality. Um, if we're having this conversation and I can see behind you two people fighting, and you behind me can see two people kissing, we're having, a, we're having a different experience in this space. But a generic soundtrack would simply give us an overall, uh, kind of like, it would be a, a non-diegetic piece which is irrelevant to either of our experience. Mm. 
Now, a composer can't cope with writing that, but if you can put the composer's mind into an engine which will allow us to have our individual experiences, that's something beyond compositional capability without the aid of a machine to help. Mm -hmm. So this is where I, I see, to answer the question of the actual panel, I see the future moving with the interactivity between humans and machines. It's an augmentation of the crafting process. I think that's very, that's very interesting um, because it also kind of opens up uh, this door to the rights, right? I mean, if you distill a two-hour composition into a two-minute composition and it's done by a machine, uh, more or less with a push of a button or maybe a human uh, person is at the end kind of checking for quality, yes or no, uh, maybe tweaking here a little bit and there a little bit. How do you go about these, um, these issues um, about the rights? Um, okay, so from a legal perspective, there's two different ways of doing this. Um, in Europe and America, we have uh, a, a contrast here. The reason why the Beatles, by the way, is so prevalent is a chap Hart made for his PhD a training set on all of the Beatles' data. So that's the reason why people use that. But it raises the rights of that IP in itself. Is an AI trained on a database? Is, is, the, is, the, is the IP in the database or is it in the AI? Mm -hmm. Now in Europe, we actually say there are rights on the database. There is ownership and there's IP in the database. In America, they don't say that. So there is automatically a conflict here being set up between regions of how this is considered. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I think that's a debate which is going to be ongoing. Mm. Um, and it raises further questions of ownership on the output as well. We have this famous case of the, um, the monkey in America which took the selfie of itself. I'm not sure if you've seen this. And, <laughs> and 230 million people looked at this selfie which had been taken by the monkey and all of the animal rights artists are saying, oh, the money should go to the monkey. And then <laughs> the rest are saying, no, it should go to the photographer. So, the, you know, these are part of the conflicts which we're naturally yeah. going to to find right, ourselves right having. Back to the monkeys. Yeah, but it's, it's not going to stop us getting away from the fact that, you know, it's, and, you know stuff, stuff like dynamic media, like um, if you look at object-based media, this is research done by BBC R&D department. If you have a 45-minute program or, or, or track list, but your journey is half an hour, do you play the first half an hour? Do you play the best half an hour? Or do you play a curated half an hour? Mm. That is going to be based on sort of training set to allow it to be able to do that. But really what you're trying to do is just, in a symbiotic way, deliver the best experience to someone who's experiencing the journey. Yeah, I'm looking forward to also having a different discussion on the uh, rights um, issue here on this stage um, soon. Um, he said curating, and that, of course, brings me to you, Shudan. Um, so, in the realm of music, um, you also mentioned that technology and arts, they always kind of um, went hand in hand. Um, when electronic means enhanced music making, uh, people were also at the beginning very skeptical whether uh, you know, that can be accepted as art or not, etc. Um, but now in the music realm, it looks like common practice. Uh, when do you think it's going to become common practice in the um, in the art scene? Um, you saw you show the picture um, of the um, AI painting by Mario Klingemann, uh, which was sold for approximately forty thousand pounds, I think, in the Sotheby's. Um, uh, but the one before, uh, which Holger showed, uh, by the, the the Christie's um, AI painting, painting uh, was done entirely by uh, the general. How do you call it? The GANs, uh, the General Adversarial Networks. Generative. Generative, um, and and um, it was sold. <laughs> For 400, I mean, it was estimated at approximately 7,000, and it sold for 70 times more than that. Um, so how? And and there, there is no human involved at all. So in Mario's painting, there was a human at least involved, Mario as the artist. So how do you how do you explain this, and how do you think um, artificial intelligence or uses of it is going to be um, common practice in the arts world? Well, I think. Um Maybe the, the other. Yeah, let's take the other. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. No. Yeah, 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 I think it's working. You think it's working? Yeah. So I think um, technology and artificial intelligence, sorry, I'm not an expert on that, so I have to say, <laughs> good call is like that. 
Um, they they bring a lot of new opportunities and changes uh, also to to the art world to artists. Uh, so as I I've shown you different um, examples, uh, artists are actually experiencing with different kind aspects of this new technologies and. Um, but of course, at the same time, it's, it's not only um, the fact that it's bringing new potentials, new, new kind, maybe new kind of creativity, new possibilities, but it's also changing the position or the definition or the, the self-awareness of an artist. What, what is an artist? Or you, you, you can eventually bring this to, to what is human, right? Mm -hmm. So that would make it too far. But um, I think... Um, Although, the, as you mentioned, the painting which was sold for 400,000 euro, uh, 400, euro as um there was not, uh, not an artist behind it like Mario Klingmann, but it was, of course, um, the program was mm -hmm. made by someone. This it, it is a, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, of course, uh, I, I personally, I, I, I don't believe that, that um, machine can, can um, one day um, be also how do you say to 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 surpass uh, yes yeah, surpass creativity and um, to to be the new artist and I I agree with what you said that um, this new technologies and artificial intelligence um, are there to enhance the creativity to help humans actually to do things better or more creative, more possibilities. And but doesn't it uh, provide some sort of entrance hurdle for lots of artists? Because now the artists should also become sort of uh, like um, you know, computer programmers, or at least be able to understand what's going on to be able to use it. Even the simplest systems um, you have shown, um, and, and Stefan uh, and, and Holger have shown, um, need a certain understanding of how to use um, I think if systems. you if you look at the art uh, artwork in, in the whole mm -hmm. uh, the part of um, the part of art or, or artists working with any kind of te technology is still a very small part mm -hmm. so if you see all the auction um, uh, from Sotheby's Christie's um, I mean the, the most uh, okay. important uh, or expensive uh, artworks are by I don't know Picasso Gerhard Richter so still mm -hmm. this classic um, conventional uh, kind of art mm -hmm. but of course for the younger generation especially when I'm working with artists on this field this is usually they are young, younger people 30 20 to 40 years mm -hmm. old so they, they I mean they grew up of course with another uh, understanding and um, another environment than artists like Richard Richter who is in his 80s of course mm -hmm. so the, there's a of course an openness and another understanding of uh, working and living with technology and this is uh, I think it's a very natural uh, development for 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 maybe artists great creative minds in, in in future generations to 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 get more involved with all these technologies um, so this brings me perfectly to my closing question to all of you in a, a short statement um, so now that we know about the developments, um, what's happening already in the AI realm, um, how are you envisioning the human and AI collaboration in the arts, let's say, in 25 years from now? What do you think is um, going to have changed and how will you have contributed to that? <laughs> well, um, uh, I don't have an, uh, <laughs> one answer, I don't know, but um, I, th I think um, of course, all this technology development was going on and it's getting better and it's giving up more, more spaces for creativity and much more uh, um, opportunities. And, um, and I think um, also um, the, potent, uh, the, the, the part of artists dealing or working with uh, technique, uh, technology and um, artificial intelligence will get, get um, bigger and play a bigger role in, in, in the art scene mm -hmm. as a whole. And um, yeah, as I said before, um, I'm working right now also with some partners, also institutions, not from the art scene, but from the te uh, tech technology scene on, on new platforms, a new kind of um, 
yeah, exhibition possibilities involving uh, technology and artists. Great. Can you pass the microphone to Stefan? So the same question. I'm taking goes, this one. Yeah. yeah, the same question goes to you as well. Uh, yeah, it's difficult, but um, for me, it's it's a difference if I'm looking to the uh, so-called industry, uh, if you're looking to the music industry and to artists. I think uh, they both have not the same um, approach and, and they don't have the same goal. That's, that's for me very, very important. So um, as an artist, I expect that they of course will reuse very, very naturally all things coming from technology. So that, that was in the past, especially for musicians, composers and all that kind of people, they don't have, they are not afraid of using new technologies and uh, this will be um, a tool for them. But um, of course in the industry it will be reused to have more efficiency when it comes to production music and all that kind of stuff and uh, they will use it differently. Mm -hmm. But in both uh, cases uh, um, machine learning uh, will play a big, big role and it's, it will be integrated very, very naturally in our today's lives and also in the art in, in every kind of way. That's too bad that we couldn't go into the discussion of music as software, which is an idea um, you presented in one of your recent talks. Um, so grab him and ask him about this idea. I think it's fascinating. It's a, it's a great approach. Um, Joe, same question goes to you. So what do we do with the time, time gained? <laughs> um, I, there are technological steps, and those steps have consequences. So uh, you asked a, a question just a moment ago, does this mean that artists have to now become familiar with AI in order to engage? Mm -hmm. I think quite the opposite. This is similar to the invention of the word processor. Before that, as, as we saw from the wonderful side from Stefan earlier, it took, back in the birth of printing, you had to have this massive craft skill of creating leading and different fonts and, and then printing press and the speed of ink through the press just to be able to produce an article or, 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 or a book. Then at the invention of the word processor, suddenly we could all do that. And it was an automation of that craft skill. But the consequence was, why are we printing it anyway? Why don't we then share it digitally? So then you have the birth of these platforms. Music is going to be the same. Um, there's going to be a, a move with AI to start automating the craft skills. And at that point, one thing we do know is that people who get to interact with their medium, with, with music or with film, they consume it for three times as long, and they're eight times more likely to share it. So we will see a blurring of the lines between what we perceive as the original artist and the audience. The audience will start interacting with the artwork and the artist will be presenting a palette from which they can do that. And that's how I see the future moving. And Patrick? You said 25 years, right? Yeah, approximately. So, so, it's a, it looks so like a few a years after my PhD, <laughs> I joined the, uh, the DLR, the, the, the German Aerospace Center Robotics Department. So it was back then the like the best uh, robotics institute in the world. And the year I came in, I heard somebody say, well, in like five years, and this is like, like late 90s, in like five years, everybody will have a robot at home. <laughs> I stayed there for a long time, and, and like every two years, I heard the same prediction. In five years, everybody will have a, a robot at home. And, and, and what I learned from that is that five years in technology prediction is like infinity. <laughs> So it stretches. So you're now <laughs> asking me for a prediction of five times infinity. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm just going to answer like, like Douglas Hofstadter did and say mu. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I think this was a <laughs> very, very interesting discussion. But unfortunately, we are not going to be mute on this stage. Uh, we're coming back uh, to the, uh, further to the next discussion. Thank you very much. So from now on, um, I take over the stage. <laughs> and, um, but I need a program because I don't know what's happening next. Thank you. You know, um, you have to improvise oftentimes. So since we are running a little behind, um, I am asked to, um, to moderate what's happening here. Um, as the next thing, and then we're going to move on 
to the next point. So I think now it's time to call on stage um, the creators of a Parsifal AI, a music theatrical encounter with a learning machine. Um, Matisse Nitschke is the uh, composer. Matisse? Oh, he's, okay, he's a busy composer. Uh, then we're going to start with Annette Josef, <laughs> who is going to be leading this discussion. Um, just until uh, Matthias gets on the stage, um, let me give you a very quick overview um, of the two people here. So um, Annette is the um, head of Munich Symphony Orchestra, um, and she's one of the responsible people to um, commission this work uh, by the composer Matthias Nitschke. And um, it's a contemporary interactive opera uh, which uses artificial intelligence um, and augmented reality to tell the story of a robot um, that is learning to become a human. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. The premiere is in 2020 in Munich. We're looking forward to that and I'm leaving the stage for you. Hello. <laughs> Okay, Mattis is coming, very good, so I'll give a start. Uh, th uh, thank you for being here. It's great to introduce our project. I come a little bit closer to you. Um, and pr uh, I'd like to start with a small introduction to the history of the project. And the first point is that I talk about Munich uh, Symphony. Munich Symphony is a small orchestra, it was the smallest symphony orchestra in Munich, and our main goal is to reach uh, approachability and accessibility to our core repertoire and to our way to, a way to make music. We have heard a lot of uh, filter bubbles, and actually I have the feeling in the symphony business we are living in a proper filter, uh, filter bubble. So that means uh, we need to um, find ways to get in touch with other ways of thinking, other ways of music we are, we are normally uh, presenting on stage. And that means we have to th rethink things. That is about new formats we will have later in that conference as well. Uh, how to use a smartphone in a concert, we are doing that already. We have great success with that. We're the first German orchestra who is using a smartphone in a sensible way in a concert. Um, and we like to think about new collaborations. Munich Symphony is a very open orchestra. Our musicians are really used to um, act on stage in a different way than other orchestra musicians. And one of the main things is that we're looking for collaborations, especially with freelancers, because I'm of the opinion that we are getting very, very important and valuable impulses from that kind of um, um, collaborations. We are living nowadays, we have a repertoire which is mainly in the history, but we are living nowadays. So it's very important for us to find a way to be contemporary. And contemporary is not about music which was written in the 50s. Contemporary means to browse all around the music scene and have a look what's going on. So, and that is where Matt is come it's into the game. And I met Mattis uh, some years ago, and we started to talk about the profile of Munich Symphony. And Mattis was very strongly attracted by the uh, idea of accessibility, of um, um, bridging the gap between the orchestra and the audience. And we were, now have been discussing, I think, for now two or three years. Something like that. Something like that and we were um, coming to new ideas, and I had the feeling, when Mattis approached me with his last version of his project, that it's a very, very good way to get in touch and to, uh, with a question of AI. That means, um, coming from the outside, looking on symphony orchestra, you would never think that it's an important task for us or an issue. Um, but we are thinking uh, that it's a great thing to um, show the audience the orchestra in a different way and to bring the audience in touch with this really important question, what it does 
mean for the average person, for the listener, for the audience. And it is for us important for, uh, about this project that is, it is something which is not exclusively for Munich Symphony Orchestra. Our vision is that this is a project which can be performed everywhere where is a space and where is an orchestra. And maybe best thing is I t uh, give the word to you. So I use this microphone here. Um, no. uh, how does this thing work? Okay. Um, allow me to give you a, a quick introduction where I'm coming from. So I'm a, a guitarist, sound designer, composer, and uh, some 10 years ago I started to uh, compose operas. So this is an opera uh, called Happy Happy, and it was commissioned and performed by the National Opera in Montpellier in southern France. And um, uh, there were, uh, no? Okay. Uh, but I have also a fine arts background, a, a visual arts background, and so this is uh, a piece called Viola. Uh, where, uh, where I'm putting the operatic voice on the, in the public uh, uh, area, in, in public space. So here the audience is sitting inside a pharmacy, looking through the window, kind of a cinema scope situation, onto the square where the singer uh, uh, comes in. Um, with the intention to transform the public space into an artistic space. And uh, th this uh, uh, got a consequence uh, in, um, in the work Vergehen. There are flyers around here. If you come to Munich, it's still on. Um, so as a matter of fact, the, the smartphone we are using every day, which really transformed our society, our daily lives, our routines, is just a little over 10 years old. So as we just learned, five years is uh, in infinity, but uh, backwards, 10 years is like not so much, and it's still it has an enormous effect. And I wondered why why we exclude the smartphone from the experience, from the concert and the opera experience. And uh, here it's an opera just for a smartphone and a public space. So it's an opera which is written and composed for a specific path at the Munich River Easer, and it runs as an app and synchronizes the opera to the path you're walking. And um, this thing is, okay. Is it possible to make the, the light on the screen a little darker? And um, um, yeah, that's a little better. So th this is uh, um, in a, a, a piece called Maya, which is supposed to be the first mixed reality opera of the world. I'm not aware of that, but it sounds good. Um, and it was late 2017, and we used uh, the last industrial ruins of Munich, uh, Heizkraftwerk Aubing, to transform it into an opera house, kind of. And um, it, it, uh, it, uh, so there are these huge ovens, and we used the graffiti as markers for an augmented reality app, uh, with which we uh, um, uh, we, we put. Um, uh, story content as a layer on top of the ovens and in this situation we used this phone as a I ca always call it a magical looking glass and it allowed the audience to look inside the oven and it would move and uh, it really felt like you're, it, the, the oven became transparent so what next um, the, the, the starting point for possible AI is the question, is it possible to put a learning machine center stage as the protagonist of an opera? And um, as, as, as much we are fascinated and overwhelmed by the developments of artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, my notion as a composer is that when, when we ask the machine to be creative, uh, that well, at least I I'm fascinated by the progress, but it's not something I wish to experience as, a, as an opera go. This will still take a while. But I figured uh, the more I 
uh, dived into deep learning and machine learning, I've started to be interested or found it really fascinating to realize how the machine learns. And this is the very subject of possible AI. And um, for, uh, as, a, as a story basis for possible AI, we use this very old legend of possible, which grew up in the forest, isolated from civilization. And then three knights arrive in this forest and he's completely overwhelmed. Who are you? Where does it look like? Where you come from? I want to be like you. And he leaves the forest uh, to learn about society, to learn about humanity, to learn about empathy. And in our case, in our version of Percival, the machine, um, Percival is a machine. Grew up isolated from civilization in the lab. And we, as an audience, we enter his space, his lab, and the machine is flabbergasted. Who, who are you? This is interesting. And it starts to ask questions. Um, the setup, so the environment in which you enter as a visitor is uh, the lab of the orchestra, so the orchestral rehearsal space, um, in which the orchestra members are spread out through the whole room. And you're not seated, you can walk around, you can get, go close to the musician. And um, you can interact with the musicians. And what I want to show here is that uh, the orchestra is already a neural network, an analog network. And it has a fascinating way to communicate inside. And this we extrapolate by use of an augmented reality app, which, uh, so when you, when you put your smartphone and hold it onto the bassoon player, Annette Josef, she will be replaced by a tree. And when you look around, you see many trees, as many trees as musicians, and you see, uh, uh, you see birds flying through the, through the trees, uh, pollen clouds, um, what's the roots, that's the English word, the communication, this hidden communication between the trees, and uh, this all reacts to the music, and actually this is the forest in which Parsifal lives, and strangely, cursively, this is actually Parsifal. So he's forest and character by himself. It's not a robot. It's a basic, a very uh, misunderstanding. What I'm fascinated in digital technology that it doesn't have a face. So when we interact with technology, there is no character, there is no face. It's a kind of spooky situation. And I don't want to simplify it by giving it a face, at least not in the beginning of the piece. Later on, we will be more theatrical and it will develop a character over the course of uh, becoming human. So, um, the question it asks is, oh, sorry, I forgot to, so this is one of the concept arts of, of, of a digital tree. Um, so there, we want to establish communication between audience and a real learning machine. By, it's, think about kind of a chatbot situation, which is the, the simplest way, but it would also, actually, my idea is that the communication uh, is done through the orchestral musicians. So each orchestral musician is a node of this, um, is an interface to possible AI. And we start talking to the, to the musician and uh, the musician is connected to our server and is an interface between us and the server. And what we do in this very stage is uh, we are building a corpus a corpus from which Parsifal later can, um, can, can, can uh, build its reality, actually. What we see here is uh, deep member Memo Akten experiencing, uh, experimenting with a, with a uh, neural network. And uh, this is about uh, recognition. So we don't see a camera 
uh, we don't see a lens which is sharpened or, or softened. It's actually the, uh, the model, the, 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 the machine learning model, trying to get a grip on what it sees. And as, as, as longer he's, he stabilizes, the better the machine recognizes him. And those are fascinating processes where, where we can learn as an audience how the machine learns. So that is what, what uh, Parsifal AI is a lot about. Um, uh, there are two artists standing out in the field of computational art. It's Mario Klingemann, we heard his name uh, sometimes already, uh, and Memo Acton. Um, uh, what we see here, it's a bit dark, is one of Mario Klingemann's pictures. He kind of posts like five pictures a day on Twitter. Uh, his tag is Quasi Mondo. And uh, it's all about glitching uh, uh, models. Um, glitches, it's not about creating the perfect face like we saw, but it's about making the creation process of the model, of the AI model, visible and, and let the, how do you say, let, let the unexpected happen. That's a very artistic process. And so what we do as an audience, what kind of model, what kind of corpus um, do we train? So one of the main questions is, how does it look like where you come from? So you start describing, okay, there are lights on the street. Oh, there are streets, there are cars. Oh, how does a car look like? It has wheels, it has windows, and so on and so forth. And uh, this uh, phase of, of training the model and building up the corpus is ended with, uh, with the entry of a sinker. And, uh, she, uh, um, and she sings, and this, this is now the start of, of the evening getting more theatrical and more fictive. And uh, we will be like, um, how do you say in English? So it's a very, it, sh it should be a very emotional moment in which the model, Parsifal AI, realizes there is something beyond language. There is something beyond communication between a chatbot and so on. So this is something which is very valuable for, for, for it, the machine. And uh, thus it, it leaves, uh, Gawain, the singer, leaves the hall to the public space. So, and um, we, uh, we follow Gawain uh, by following Parseval AI, who's going out and intrudes, hacks, cameras in the streets, in the cameras in the smartphones, cameras in, in cash machines or whatever, to find Gawain and learn from encounters of Gawain in the street with pedestrians, with other actors, scripted, improvised. And what we don't show to the audience uh, are those video streams of these surveillance cameras, but we actually show how Possible AI sees. That's the very uh, important point. So here we see several working methods of, of, of a machine uh, uh, seeing public uh, situations. It can very reliably see cars, it can recognize people, it can recognize faces. It's all very fast, so this might help us seeing it, but what is really interesting is um, these kind of uh, artistic um, approaches. So here we see Memo Acton on his webcam uh, on, on the computer with his model, and three outputs of a real-time machine learning model. One is trained on stardust, on, 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 on stars, galaxies, one is trained on fire, and one is trained on clouds. And what you can do with that is something like this. So, left is a real-time webcam where he does kind of silly stuff and right is the real-time output of the, his model which is trained on sea waves. And what it does, it tries to match 
all what it's learned from these thousands and thousands of C pictures to match what it gets as the input from, what is English word for Lappen? <laughs> Lump. Lump. <laughs> well, yeah. Mm -hmm. So and if, you, if you skip to, to half of the video, could you do that? So there we have a rock. Could you, could you go to the to half of the video? So here his model is trained to fire. And if you go to three-fourths of the video. Can you skip again to the last quarter? Yes, yeah, exactly like this. So here it is trained on flowers. So imagine uh, you, you met the model in the beginning of the, of the performance and you told the model that outside everything what you see are toothbrushes. 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 <laughs> so you can imagine that when, when Parsifal uh, leaves the hall and, and, and looks in the street, suddenly the street lights will look like toothbrushes and windows will look like toothbrushes. And uh, the idea is that you, actually, that you realize that what the machine sees is a direct outcome of how you built its corpus. And to make you aware of the machine is as dumb as you are. It's not very intelligent what's happening out there in machine learning. It's all happening on the corpus you built, all the bias, all the eth ethnic biases, all the, all the uh, discriminations we experience, it's all built in the corpuses we now feed to the algorithms. So this is something uh, what I hope you realize during this performance. So you At the same time, it is uh, a very poetic reflection. I'm running out of time, right? Yep, you're running out of time. <laughs> uh, so. Okay, I skipped the music part. <laughs> there's actually, there's a lot going on, on on several layers. This gives you an idea of the complexity, what happens, and uh, it is about complexity. It's not of any use if we try to simplify this matter. So you see, it's a really complex um, happening we are planning, and I'm sure that it's a great opportunity to bring everything together, AI, symphony orchestra, structures of a symphony orchestra, and it can be a benefit, I think, for a cultural institution like a symphony orchestra. And I repeat it again, um, I think it's very important to, to stress the fact that we are planning a project which is for other orchestras as well. And uh, everybody who is interested is invited. We are looking still for partners for that one. We have already two partners who want to do this happening in their very own spaces. Um, but if you like to join us, you are very welcome. Thank you for your attention. Thanks so much.